grace we have been saved through faith And it's not from ourselves It is the gift of God Not by our works so that no one can boast We are called to be free But we do not use our freedom To live for sin And so we serve and love each other Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Well, we appreciate being here. Uh, this is always kind of awkward to be uh, talking about yourself, I guess. And we've done a little bit more in the last year or two than we ever have before. Never drew much attention to ourselves. And so. Anyway, we thought we'd just kind of go through back and forth a little bit about the journey we've all been on and, and a little bit about our history and then, uh, and then our time as Latter-day Saints and then kind of our journey getting to where we're at right now. So um, I was, and I don't know, some of you may have seen some of our other videos or things that we've done, a 17-minute thing that I did with Sean McCraney and so on, so I hope... This isn't too much of a repeat for some of you. I was born in Gunnison, Utah, down in central Utah, and didn't live there very long. My family moved up here to Salt Lake, and I ended up <clears throat> going to uh, Bryant Junior High School and South High, and so uh, just kind of had, had a normal, well, I shouldn't say normal, I guess. My, my, my dad actually passed away when I was uh, 11, and then uh, my mom passed away uh, when I was 16, and I ended up being raised, or the last few years at least, I had an aunt, aunt and uncle that kind of took care of me. And then at 19, I went on a mission. <clears throat> now, while I was growing up, I was, we were very active. My mom was <clears throat> active, and um, we went to... Uh, all the meetings, and I was a scout and deacon and teacher and priest and all that stuff growing up. And when when my mom passed away, it was just always, a, I just knew I was going on a mission. And I had three kind of goals, one to go on a mission, one to get through the University of Utah, and the other was to marry a sweet young lady in the temple. Those were my three big goals. So uh, I got got a call to go on the to Denmark on my mission and spent 30 months there. Was the, back then there were two and a half year missions because you didn't, they didn't have an MTC, a missionary training center for the language, so you learned it on the spot. I used to knock on doors and that's about all we did in Denmark because it was like 97% Lutheran and they just, our phrase was ingen interest, no interest. And so uh, that's what we did most of the time was knock on doors. But I think my companions used to always tell me that I had a, he said, I'm sorry about this, Mexican accent with my Danish, you know. So I was this guy trying to speak Danish, but I had this uh, Hispanic accent. So I'm sure it didn't, they didn't understand it probably. And maybe that's why the doors never stayed open very long. I don't know. But So I got home from my mission and... Uh, uh, I guess maybe you should share where you're at up to this point. Oh, okay. Um, I went to West High School, grew up in Salt Lake City, never lived anywhere else, was all, always very active in the church, and in fact, I even waited for a missionary while he was on his mission and really didn't do any dating, just sent him letters. <laughs> and. Uh, Anyway, when he came home, things didn't work out, and I think Earl came home from his mission in March. Yeah. And then we met in July at Men and Gleaners, for anyone that's old enough, it's kind of like young adults. And that's where we met in July, and got engaged in October and married in February in the Salt Lake Temple. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I brought okay. us up to that point. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> anyway, Carla has one sister. We'll talk about her in, probably in a few minutes. I have four sisters. They're all younger. And um, anyway, we'll talk about them in a minute too, I guess. But uh, we were totally active in the church. We 
always held temple recommends, and we were always, of course, as young people, we uh, kind of visited mom and dad and stuff during the on Sunday sometimes. So you you kind of have that few times, but even at that, we held callings all the way along. I was gospel doctrine teacher several times, and. Uh, after we got through with the Army, I ran out of student deferments, and so, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, out of, out of University of Utah, I ran out of student deferments, so I got drafted during the Vietnam era. We ended up in Fort Lewis, Washington and for a while, and then ended up in Germany on, uh, in the military, and was in there for about 19, 20 months, and then we got out and came home and started living our life. and raising, we, we had four children, or have four children, and uh, again, just very active all the time. I was a branch president, actually, in a serviceman's branch over in Germany, and then came home, and uh, so just real quickly, callings that, that we've had, or I've had, uh, been on a high council, and gospel doctrine teacher, high, group, high priest group leader, and then in Sandy, I served as a bishop for five years, and all this time, uh, in fact, we were talking about it during our meal t tonight. Did I have a testimony of the gospel, of, well, the Mormon gospel? And I unequivocally say I do, or did. I was just to totally convinced I was a student uh, of the gospel. I read the Book of Mormon 30 or so times, and then the Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, and all the books, Jesus the Christ, and all the Skousen books, and McConkie books, and Talmadge books, and so I was just a, consumed by the church. I just believed it was true, and um, so there was really, and bore my testimony regularly, um, and during gospel doctrine lessons and so on, you just teach and bear your testimony at the end. You want to talk a little bit about your callings and testimony? Oh, yeah. Let's see, I've served, um, sounds like I'm bragging and I'm not, I'm just telling you <laughs> what I did. Let's see, I served as a primary president in two stake primary presidencies, in a stake relief society presidency, in um, several ward relief societies. I always pretty much worked in primary and relief society. Once in a while, or one time I did have a calling in young women but my love was always primary. And the reason I liked to be there so much was I was just drawn to the children. I mean, and I would always tell people, this is where the angels are. They were so sweet and they were so innocent. I just loved primary. At the time I left the church, I was serving as first counselor in the Relief Society in our ward. And that was just, I had been just released from the state primary. Um, before I was serving in that calling. And I've just, all, oh, and I've taught um, spiritual living lessons in Relief Society and uh, just always been really active. And I'd have to say I really had a testimony that it was true. But, you know, it was all based on feelings. There, I mean, there were the facts, you know, the all the pyramids and things in the in uh, Central America, I just assumed those were Book of Mormon ruins. I never questioned anything. Um, I just listened to my priesthood leaders and the leaders of the church and my dear husband. Yeah. And they all knew the truth. <laughs> well, and, and in this study process, there were things that would come up. Um, nothing as much as I know now about problems in, in Mormon theology, but uh, if there was ever any question, it was kind of put it on the shelf, I'll deal, it, deal with it later, I'll, I'll understand it when I go through the millennium and return to God and return, you know, to God, and I'll, I'll figure it out later, the polygamy, the um, few things about the Book of Mormon, but, you know, being as busy as a person is in the church and raising a family and having a career and doing the things I... I actually ended up working for the National Credit Union Administration for 30 years, and we audited the federal credit unions here in the state and around the country. And, and uh, you know, so being busy, you just don't really spend a lot of time studying details, and anything that 
was kind of an offish nature. You just didn't really spend any time studying it and not really getting into it. And I think that is one of the problems with, with the LDS people. Not only do they have a comfort level with their religion, they don't want to rock the boat, but they really are busy and don't have or don't take the time to spend any extra time studying something that's beyond uh, just the basics. And any time anything comes up that looks suspicious or makes them think a little bit beyond the normal kind of shallow thinking they do, it just isn't, uh, they just don't go much beyond that um, and find out real details. Well, we're so grateful that God kind of moved in, in my heart, I guess, the way he did, because I am analytical and I'm kind of a, again, had been a student and believed the church was very was true and all that. But I started, a um, situation came up in, uh, I think, 2005, President Hinckley had asked or challenged us all to read the Book of Mormon by the end of the year, and this was like in August or September, and so I dutifully got through the Book of Mormon like in October, November that year and I'd always carried around or had for some reason this 1830 copy of the Book of Mormon and it uh, something I guess we picked up in Independence on one of our trips back there we'd gone to Carthage and Nauvoo and done the whole thing there and been to the sacred grove and it was so yeah, sacred there yeah, <laughs> peaceful hallowed ground <laughs> and um, so anyway, I pulled up this 1830 Book of Mormon and decided to read it, just kind of as finish off, maybe read the Book of Mormon twice before the end of the year. And so I got through the, started reading it and got into the first few chapters in First Nephi, chapter 11 and 12 and I think 15, 13, 13. And I noticed that the wording had changed, or was different than what I just read. And I've, again, I've read the Book of Mormon many times, so it caught my I, and to repeat for those of you that may have heard it before, but it, it says in the 1830 Book of Mormon um, that Jesus is the son, is that Mary was the mother of God. And in our current Book of Mormon, it says Mary is the mother of the Son of God. So they changed this mother of God to Son of God. And there were two other, couple of other places where it says Jesus is the everlasting Father. And I read that, and then I flip over to my current, my new book of Mormon, my current book of Mormon, and it says Jesus is the Son of the Everlasting Father. Well, obviously that's a conflict. I mean, it's a, and and why did it get changed? Because I believed that the Book of Mormon had been translated word for word by the power of God, and that Joseph couldn't move from one word to another without uh, mm -hmm. um, getting it right. Getting it right. What did you? I'm sorry. Nothing. You're sure. Yeah. Okay. That was some kind of a high sign on. <laughs> no. I'm going too long. Is it too no, no. late? What happened? <laughs> Just moving my arm. Okay. Anyway, so again, this analytical thing kind of kicks in, and I mull this over because this just doesn't make any sense. Well, I did end up picking up some other scriptures that are in the Book of Mormon now, Mosiah 15 and Alma 11 where it talks about there only being one God and that God himself would come down and take flesh upon himself and, and because he did that, he'd be called the Son of God. Well, so I started looking at other things like the first vision and uh, I thought, well, that will answer the question of what Joseph Smith thought. <clears throat> and so I looked at uh, the f accounts of the first vision and all of a sudden realized that there are many accounts of the first vision and the one that's in act, actually in Joseph Smith's own handwriting, which is also the earliest, was dated 1832, and it just uh, says that he saw one person. Well, that was confusing, and added to the, well, that doesn't make any sense, but it matches up kind of with the Book of Mormon problem. Then I went to um, the Lectures of Faith that was part of the Doctrine and Covenants until like 1926 or something, it also had some significant things there. It said that God was a spirit, that Jesus was in the bosom of the Father, and that he came and took on a tabernacle, and that he and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one God. Again, a real conflict with what the church teaches now and what, uh, what I had always believed. So mulling this over and, and just came, came up with these 
questions and over a period of time just became more and more upset and miserable and trying to reconcile really these thoughts that, gee, I think Joseph Smith believed in a Christian God. He believed in one God. And it wasn't till later, and I knew the account of the first vision that he had written in the Pearl of Great Price that's there now was written in 1838. And so this is well after these other dates of, of the Book of Mormon and the first vision. Anyway, so I was miserable. Your turn. My turn? <laughs> Give you a break? No. Well, he was miserable for a couple of years. In fact, he retired. He's older than me. He doesn't look it, but he is. <laughs> he retired <laughs> about seven years before I did. And then when I retired, if it was about, what, three, years, three or four years ago, uh, he just seemed so... Oh, I can't explain it, but... I don't want to say Henri because he's not Henri, um, but he just was discontented. And I just thought, you know what? He's having a real hard time with me being retired. And I was kind of infringing on his dishwasher. He's been <laughs> <laughs> truly, he's, I mean, he's still, of the dishes. he still pretty much takes care of the dishwasher. He's a sweetheart, but I couldn't imagine what was wrong. I knew something was wrong. And I questioned him, questioned him, and he'd say, oh, no, there's nothing. And I'd say, but you're not bearing your testimony in church like you used to. And he says, well, I bear it when I teach my gospel doctrine class. And that still didn't satisfy me because this is a man that at least once or twice a year gets up and bears his testimony in fast and testimony meeting. So he wasn't doing that. And... Um, I just couldn't imagine what was wrong, and I pestered him for about six or seven months. And then um, the kids were all at our home for Christmas. Our kids from uh, Phoenix came up, and they asked me, what's the matter with Dad? And I says, I don't know, but there's something wrong. And, and this, um, was, this was 2010. 2010, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And it took me until February. I would, you know, ask him every, at least twice a week, what is wrong and when are you going to tell me? Twice a day. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know Carla. She well, did. it may be it was more than twice a week. <laughs> but he yeah. said, well, yeah, there is something, but it's life-altering, and I, I just don't care to share. So I just didn't know what had happened. Did you think he was dying? <laughs> no. And I, I knew he wasn't having an affair. And, you know, I kind of thought he had had a vision or something. I, You know what? I... I guess I thought maybe it was spiritual. I thought maybe he was just burned out from all his church service. That was the main thing I thought, but I didn't know what was going to be so earth-shattering or change our lives until a morning in February. He, we kind of had talked the night before, so I kind of thought he was going to tell me what was wrong. And he came into the living room, and I was sitting there like a good person. I just taught a lesson in Relief Society how you need to read your Book of Mormon every day. And so there I was sitting reading my Book of Mormon that I love so much. And when he came in, um, you want me to keep going? I'll be sure. quick. Please. <laughs> he, yeah. <laughs> he said, I'm not sure that Joseph Smith was truly a prophet. Well, that just, it didn't even blow me away. I, I mean, it was just so surreal. And he gave me a list of a few things that he was questioning in the church. And I just held my Book of Mormon to my chest. And I said, Earl, I know that the church is true. I really did have a testimony. And I just bore my testimony about the Book of Mormon and about the prophet Joseph. That's really hard to say now. And how much I loved him and all the sacrifices that he had made for us and that he truly was martyred. And this was the testimony I bore to Earl. And then one more thing, it was a few weeks later, Earl, well, actually it was longer than that. It was after I came out of the church, so it was a couple of months later. But all of a sudden I realized, here I bore him a testimony of the Book of Mormon, of the prophet Joseph Smith, and never said a word to him about my testimony of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That was very a very aha, profound moment. 
Your turn. Okay. <laughs> and back to you, Earl. Well, <laughs> part, part six. Anyway, so I... Did, over the period, did that just ahead. dawn on you, or did he have to point that? No, out? It, no just, it dawned on her. Doing, yeah. yeah. Well, I had started watching Sean McCraney's Heart of the Matter, uh, probably about oh seven, oh eight, and um, very upsetting. And I didn't like it. Didn't like him. <laughs> and but one thing that he did, and I don't know how many of you have seen this, but he did a chalkboard presentation where he had these five panels. And, and I thought it was probably the fairest thing I'd ever seen anybody present. If you ever get a chance to see it, I think it's pretty good. And he talks about the five areas that we can agree on, five that we, or not five, but the one panel was the things we agree on. You mean between Christians and Mormons? Between Christians and Mormons, sorry, thank you. And then um, things that we agree on, things that we, eh, and then things that we don't really like as Christians, but the Mormons want them, so they can have it. And that included like three degrees of glory in the Book of Mormon and having a prophet. He's, you know, and I thought this is a fair, because, you know, there, and he had explanations for each one. And then there was one that was kind of anti-Christian, the Mormons' concepts. And then there were some that were actually anti-God and everything. And when he got through those, I, you know, it, it just was a logical kind of a sequence of, of thought process. And I started watching him more and more and what was funny is Carla um, until that morning that I sat down with her I never verbalized this at all so it wasn't really a part of me you you know you can kind of watch TV or watch Sean or Doris or something and Doris Hanson and Polygamy What Love Is This and listen to these things and not um, not really make a part of you but your thought process your thinking and stuff at least that's what I did and and Carla would be gone on Tuesdays and Thursdays to an aerobics, water aerobics thing she was doing. And uh, she'd come in about 8.30 and I'd have to flip the channel or turn it off so that she, you know, I didn't want to taint my wife at all with this interesting stuff that I was looking at. And so, so I'd never verbalized it. And when I finally did to her that morning, it, it all of a sudden became part of me. It was, I was saying things that I had only thought in my head, never said them out loud, that I didn't think Joseph Smith was a prophet or there was a problem with the Book of Mormon and so on. <coughs> well, so much has happened since then, and I don't know how much detail to, to go through, but Grant Palmer's book was influential, The Insider's View of Mormon Origins. Sean's show continued to be important uh, in teaching me. And I've said to some people about this being kind of a good news, bad news thing, or bad news first and then good news. The bad news was that I came, became very convinced that the church wasn't true, that Joseph Smith wasn't a prophet, that there were problems with the Book of Mormon, the changes in the Book of Mormon. Then I learned about the Book of Abraham, which really tipped me over the scales. And uh, that one was, we, we didn't even know about polygamy and... Um, well, we knew about polygamy, but well, not that Joseph. The problems and the, the details. The teenagers and the that he had all these wives. We didn't. We were never but, taught that in the church. And he married women. He married, took his wives. Married women and and just all these different things. And I actually had so many profound moments where I would think, okay, this is going to prove the church is true. And and some of them centered around the Book of Commandments and the Doctrine and Covenants. And I thought, here here it says in the Doctrine and Covenants that this and this and this. And then I would go back and look at the Book of Commandments that was a few years before the Doctrine and Covenants and it said, not necessarily different, but it, things were omitted or added, changed. So again, it was just so many different things that came along that uh, more and more would just pull away at my testimony. But the, the interesting thing is, is that, and even though Carla took her six, eight weeks to come out, or after I discussed it, she was at least willing to look. I think she got filled up pretty fast. I, I didn't look or want to look for the first couple of weeks. And luckily I went to Phoenix for a few days to visit my son right after he had told me. So that helped me kind of get away from it all. And so we, the thing was is that we didn't realize that we had a problem with Jesus. I mean, even this, this bad news that we were com I was coming up with and it eventually shared with Carla, none of that involved Jesus or the nature of God, mm -hmm. the Trinity, the, uh, the grace and works and, and, the, and what he did on the cross and all that stuff. So 
we still were in for a great treat to, to learn now about the good news, the, mm. the, the best part of this whole journey. And that was that we were in need of a Savior. We didn't think we were sinners. We were good people and going to heaven. And uh, in fact, we'd been working our little rear ends off for many, many years to get to the <laughs> celestial kingdom, right? But I was always worried that I wasn't worthy, that I wasn't doing enough. And I keep reassuring yeah. her, yes, the brethren have said that if we're married in the temple and we don't commit murder or something, we're going to make it, you know. And, <laughs> so we just had that goal and again didn't realize that we were in need of a savior so we just have appreciated that part of our journey so much that, that what Jesus did for us that we we are sinners we fall short and we've never admitted that in our whole Mormon life that we were ever falling short we thought we were maybe not working as hard every moment as we could but we certainly thought we were going to mm -hmm. make it didn't we? Uh, yeah kind of I hope I always felt like I was living a terrestrial life, not a celestial one. So anyway, we uh, started uh, going to Sean's Bible classes up at the... We thought that was harmless enough because it really wasn't going to a church. We were just... <laughs> but it was so fun to listen to someone teach out of the Bible. It was so unique. Instead of being a topic and have, pulling out little scriptures here and there, I've since gone back to my missionary Bible and looked at the underlying portions and there are all these two sticks of Joseph and all these different LDS scriptures and all the ones about grace and and um, they're, they're just as wide as they can be and I had never underlined them or I didn't have any concept of, of this great God that we we love and worship now but anyway I we went to a fast and testimony meeting in May of mm -hmm. 2011 and that was really difficult because we were both kind of now sitting there listening to these listening to these testimonies that are just we we knew that they were when they say well we know joseph um the book of mormon's true and that joseph smith had a first vision or whatever we say for that to, or they say that uh, joseph smith and all that and we just knew well you really don't know you haven't studied there is and I, by then i'd read this bh roberts book on the Book of Mormon, and he didn't believe it either, and I just knew that people just didn't know. Well, tell him who B. H. Roberts oh, is. Well, he's a church historian, mm -hmm. from well respected, and uh, never did leave the church, but he certainly wrote a great book about the problems of the Book of Mormon, linguistics and chariots and swords and so on, not being around. Anyway, so uh, Mother's Day in May, that was the last time we actually attended church, and about um, middle of August. We'd been going out to Sean's thing for a while, and of course introduced to him and talked to him a number of times. And I finally said to him when we met with him, and I said, you know, my temple recommend runs, runs out in May of 2012, and I have been a bishop, and I thought, well, maybe, you know, if uh, you're interested, I'd be willing to share my story on your show or some, whatever I was saying. And he said, you know how many people I get that want to be on my show? And he says, I get like four or five a week. And um, and I'm not sure exactly the sequence, but he did say, when do you want to do it? <laughs> and I said, well, I know you're going through the Book of Mormon this year, so why don't we, uh, or maybe it was the A to Z, whatever he was doing in 2011. And I said, uh, you know, sometime next year, but just before May 2012, before my temple recommend runs out. <laughs> and he said, well, uh, how about next week? And well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of caught wow. me off guard. So for the next week, we, one of my son, my well, my kids, I guess, and Carla, we just started working on that 17-minute thing, and it was really from God because there are things there that I didn't know anything about. When I talked to some of those portions in there, God would kind of wake me up at five in the morning on, during that week and pop another thought in my head, and I'd go scramble and write it down. I really feel blessed with. Uh, that that was able to occur but anyway so we gave this seven it turned out well that was the other funny thing sean said well i could probably give you six or eight minutes <laughs> and i you know a few days later i was working on it that was like, like a monday and it was the week from that tuesday so it was like eight days and i call him up a day or so later he went, it's it's up to eight or nine minutes now well no no that's okay and finally it got to 12 14 minutes and oh no that's fine and so and I said, you know, you, do you want to read this? Get, 
have this draft of this thing? And he says, no. He says, no, I don't need that. And, that. and I said, well, I really appreciate you trusting me. He says, I don't trust you. I trust God. And it was a really, it's so shocking because, and even when Carla and I went up to the Bible thing. And you the first time. Yeah. yeah, the first time you Christians do this, but he prayed with us. <laughs> he put his arms around us and prayed. And I thought, my goodness, this is unique. And then his comment, you know, because I would have, oh well, yeah, I want to see what you're going to say on my show, you know, and that's what I would have said. And when I, when I said, well, I really appreciate you trusting me, and he said, I don't trust you, I trust God. And I guess he just felt like uh, what was going to be said was, was what God wanted to be said. So I really appreciated that. But anyway, I gave the 17 minutes, and we were talking about this also at lunch, or at the dinner here. We, um, that was in August. And by November, our state president had contacted us and told us that we needed to come in for a court. And we just kind of let that whole thing slide. We, didn't, we had been released from our callings, of course, but we'd, and we weren't going to church, but we'd never asked to have our name removed or anything. We just thought, we'll see what happens. But I kind of think, I'm not sure, but we think maybe he got some pressure to, uh, to take some action on us or something. But one thing that was kind of interesting about our court, we got all prepared. We had heard Grant Palmer taken like six hours in his court, and we thought, okay, we're going to be prepared and go witness and mm -hmm. share and all this stuff. Well, we were out in the lobby, the foyer, and, um, and the state president came out and said, no, I don't want you to say anything. I don't want you to bear your testimony or say anything. And I just want you to sit there basically so and we answer questions yeah and so we uh, he defined apostasy and because we hadn't committed any sins other than studying our way out of the church you know and and i had done the 17 minutes which was kind of again even that was factual i was really concerned or was interested in what he was going to say because everything i said about the book of mormon lectures of faith book of abraham all that stuff is just true it, there's no it's not up for debate, it's just church facts. Church doctrine. Church doctrine, and so I was curious, but the conclusions were, uh, and, and, we were in, and we were really willing and ready to be uh, excommunicated, which is what they did. He asked us if we believed in the Book of Mormon, and uh, was Joseph Smith a prophet, and then President Monson, and was the church true? And we, of course, answered no to those. And, and then it was, again, kind of like Carla's situation a few weeks later. We sat there thinking, you know, we've been excommunicated from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and they didn't ask us one question about our relationship with Jesus Christ. And I thought that was so interesting that they would be concerned about our testimony of Joseph and the Church and President Monson and stuff, not about our... Uh, our relationship with God or Jesus. So, anyway, so I think we're kind of uh, getting to a point here. We, we actually, uh, Carla's sister. You want to tell about that a little bit? Yeah. Before that, real quickly, um, I had had a born again experience in March, but in April we decided that we needed to visit with our bishop. And we knew that he was going to ask us if we'd fasted, if we'd prayed, and if we'd been to the temple. So we went to the temple just to give, you know, just to give the church one more chance. And I was sitting, um, waiting to go through the veil. And for those of you that are familiar with the temple ceremony, uh, they have a prayer circle. And I was, of course, sitting with the other women, not in the prayer circle. And I veiled my face with the veil, the temple veil. And I was just praying to Heavenly Father, please tell me, I need to know if the church is true or not. You know, my eternal salvation depends on it. And the thought that was in my head was, it's not true, let it go. That was such a moment in my life, um, just validated everything. And I knew I was, you know, hearing the truth that I needed to leave the church that it wasn't true, but um, my sister was very upset. Uh, We've been fighting. Um, a year ago Christmas, she beat me up really bad because I said to her, you don't even know what a Christian is, and we got into quite a discussion. There's just the two of us. We've always been really close, but we had shared all these things that we'd learned with her prior to this time, 
And then this spring, she called Earl on the phone and said, Earl, we need to talk. And that was the beginning of the end of Mormonism for her. And I'm happy to say she's been born again. Amen. Praise God. It's wonderful. And uh, it's just great to see her grow. And boy, she's a little witness. <laughs> I think that must be her special gift. She's witnessing to people in her ward and, and our friends. And it's been a wonderful, joyous thing to have her with us. Yeah, that's, that, that phone call is one I keep waiting. Two of our children, one's in a bishop break and the other actually works for the church and is in a stake young men's president. Um, and we keep waiting for those phone calls that would say, Dad, we need to talk. Because uh, mm. we've tried to share, but it's, you know, there's a, it just, um, there's just such a blindness. Such You're in a, a fog. And, and, I was. And we didn't, we didn't know we were in it, in, in the fog and, or the blindness, and uh, we just pray, of course, that they, they will eventually, that God will touch their heart, mm -hmm. or somebody will talk to them and share a story or a scripture or something that makes them start thinking. Well, um, just to kind of finish out the, our life here, we, after the excommunication, and that was in November, and then in uh, Maybe it was December, January, then January, Sean kind of came to me and said, I've always wanted to interview people who are, have been LDS, who transitioned through, and I'm now Christian. He said, I can find all the old former LDS I want, but I want to get people that have actually come to Christ. And so he asked me if I was interested in hosting a television show, The Sex Files, as it's turned out to be, and I said, well, I, you know, if God wants me to, or if, <laughs> if you're willing, or if he's willing, and... So I, I always say, and I've said it here tonight to somebody, but you know, I think God has a sense of humor because I really have I'm not very polished. I'm not very, you know, I'm not a deep voice and all those kinds of things you'd look for in a journalist type person. But but if God can use me and whatever I have to offer, I'm I'm willing to do that. But anyway, we've we've been able to interview people who have left the church, have transitioned out but have found Christ, and it's been a, a real joy. It's been strengthening for us to mm. read these stories, too, because they all have a common, several common denominators, and if you've watched any of the shows, you, you know that there's a, a certain amount of blindness that is there with people before they come to know, and when, they, when their eyes are opened, it's just, it's, uh, I guess, palpable. It's, it's, it's real. They become born again, regenerated of the mm -hmm. Spirit, and, and it's been really neat to, to have people share their stories. Do you have something? No, that's okay. okay. Anyway, uh, so I mean, if we've interviewed a whole bunch of people already, and we're uh, taped out into, into next year already, and so we're really grateful for the response, and people that are willing to share their stories. So. What time is the show on and what channel? It's on Friday nights at 8 o'clock on TV 20. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. And live streaming at? It's not live streaming yet. It's it the, it's be. archived. They put mm -hmm. them on later, but I'm not sure how current that is right now. There was a little bit of a delay, but some, a few a number of stories are on there already. But. Which, what would they go to? Do you know what the... Oh, ex-Mormon, ex-MormonFiles.tv. But it's E-X. Yeah, E-X. ex-MormonFiles.tv. Excellent. No dash in between X and Mormon. No. Okay. No. So anyway, I guess we could, we did, uh, we were baptized Christian on March 10th, 2012. <laughs> and that was a, a joyful day. Joyous day. And mm -hmm. so, but to be born of the Spirit, that's this given that a lot of thought and what is involved in that and and it, it's a real thing and when Christ uh, told Nicodemus that you must be born of water and of the spirit um, we of course read that as Latter-day Saints many times but we just figured it meant baptism and you got the gift of the Holy Ghost when you're eight and what do you know at eight and what sins have you committed at eight but but being able to turn our lives over to Christ as a, a, adults and to feel of his spirit ha and to, to experience what we've experienced mm -hmm. has been wonderful so and we have a great confidence in in uh, return or not returning to go to being with god <laughs> at, at this point something yeah. that we didn't really 
I guess we felt it, but we didn't believe it so much as, as Latter-day Saints. Anyway, I'm going to open it up for questions. We got question? just a little yeah, bit I of... have a question, yes. Carla. Mm -hmm. You shared with how you knew something was wrong, but you quite couldn't figure out what was wrong. With Earl? With Earl. Uh -huh. When he was going through his doubting phase. Mm -hmm. And so when he did present to you, were you prepared for something like that? Did it take a while for you to register? Because I can't imagine growing up Mormon, being indoctrinated to the point to where you have, and being with him married for so many years, believing together as a couple, and then all of a sudden having that division. You know, I think it took me a day or two for it to really sink in what he was saying. And then I thought, oh my goodness, my eternal salvation's at stake here. I might lose my husband, but I have such a testimony of the church, the LDS church, I just assumed that uh, Heavenly Father would take care of me. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just all so surreal. But it only went about probably, oh, probably what, three weeks or so before I started listening to things that he said, but I did find comfort in the church, in the LDS church. I, I will did. say, too, that I got a little spoiled with Carla because, again, first time telling anybody, and she's in shock, but within six weeks or so, eight weeks, she starts listening to, well, you know, show me what we've got here, and so I showed her the Book of Mormon, lectures of faith, and all this stuff, and and she started at least seeing and was willing to listen. And I kind of thought, well, this is what everybody's going to do because <laughs> they all know Earl Erskine. He's a good guy. He's always lived honorably and been active in the church. So he must have found something worthwhile to listen to. So maybe I should pay, you know, take a minute and listen to at least what he's got. I haven't found very much of that, actually. No. So I, I really praise God that Carla was willing to... Uh, because this, I don't know what this journey would have been, uh, wouldn't have worked without her. So no. I'm so grateful that she was willing to at least look and and to have. And she mentioned this born again moment. Do you want to share that real quick about? Oh yeah, we were. Well, this was back in. I don't know the date. I feel bad. Mm -hmm. I guess it really doesn't matter. It was in March of 2011, but we were listening to uh, 8:20, the you know Christian radio station. And um, out of Mormonism, the um, Concerned Christians was on out of Mesa, Arizona, and Andy Poland was interviewing uh, Adams Road. And Micah was uh, being interviewed that night, and he was talking about his um, uh, coming out of the LDS church on his mission, and then how this group had formed the band, and then they wrote this song, I Would Die For You. And so then the band sang that song, I Would Die For You. And um, in one place in the song, um, these aren't the words exactly right there, but it said, whose eyes and face were I looking into, or was I looking into when I was hanging on the cross? And I saw the Savior before me. His eyes pierced mine and pierced my heart. And all my sins washed away. It was just, it just took my breath away. And that was in March. And then it was about two or three, two or three weeks later that I got that confirmation in the temple. And I was just giddy when I was in the temple. I was so excited. You know, I guess I didn't want the LDS church to be true. I mean, I was just so happy from being born again. I was really hoping that, you know... Mormonism was not true. Everything around you thought that you were feeling the spirit. Yeah. <laughs> well, what was really funny yeah. is, is I came through the veil, and she was already in what they call the celestial room, and so I was walking in and looking down to look around for her. I finally saw her, and she has this big smile on her face oh. and was really happy looking, and I thought, oh, crap. <laughs> no. She's, she's been convinced now that the church is true. Oh boy! And so I sit down by her, and 
so she shares with me that it's not true let it go thing and boy that was a thrill. <laughs> it's been thrilling ever since. <laughs> oh. Any other questions or something? Yeah. Yeah. What about your kids? I mean, I mean, you said you have a couple boys, but what about Jennifer? And yeah, we have. How many kids do you have? We have four, four. children. We four. had uh, three boys and a girl. Two. Uh, Jennifer is is a uh, Christian and has married a young Christian man and we're really happy for them and they're, they're doing wonderfully. She's had a beautiful born again experience, yeah. Jennifer has. So did you guys share directly with her? Or? Yeah, we've, we've been able to sit down with all of them. With her and Scott, our youngest. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And we've actually been able to share with all of our kids, but two of them are just hanging on and, and struggling with yeah. your mom and dad's kind of deserted them, so to speak, and things that we've taught them our whole lives of, you know. And we haven't shared the thing that's, a lot of the doctrine with them because they won't well, let us. Well, you know? and there's some both married return missionaries. I mean, they lived exactly the way we brought them up to live. Darn return, it. They're return missionaries. <laughs> they're married return missionaries. You know, Eagle Scout, active in the church. I mean, we couldn't have asked for any better kids, and any better Mormons. they're holding to it, and mm -hmm. and so we're, uh, but we're praying for them, and we hope that they'll eventually have their hearts softened and touched. And yeah. the thing is, that's so funny is, if I was a Christian, and I had adopted Mormonism and was coming to my children with gold plates and books that couldn't be documented, either the Bo book of polygamy. Abraham or, and doctrines of polygamy and becoming gods and temple and masonry ceremonies and handshakes. to my Bible. So I could understand if it was reversed and I was trying to throw them this other gospel on top. But I'm I'm trying to share with them something that I believe now is just so basic. The, the, mm -hmm. the Bible's trustworthy. So simple. And uh, anything above that is what shouldn't be trusted. And so we're hoping they catch yeah. the vision there someday. Well, I tried to share with my son that lives in Phoenix. I tried to share Jesus with him and my relationship with Jesus. And he says, well, I've got a, a wonderful relationship with Jesus. And he says, Mom, maybe you just missed the boat in the church. And, oh boy, that really dug deep because <laughs> I hadn't missed the, the boat. Maybe I, well, I probably had in the LDS church. I didn't know Jesus. I just thought I had. No, I don't. We know that there are yeah. people like Sean has mentioned in his book, uh, Born Again Mormon, that I, we, we trust that there are people that can be LDS or Mormon and be born again. But I think, once, I think once you've been born again and you realize what the simple gospel of grace is, that it would eventually, well, why do we do the temple then? If Jesus is enough, then why do we have this? And why do I have to do this? And it eventually would, would kind of gnaw at them, I think. So did Scott and Jennifer come out about the same time? Mm. Yeah, Scott's, uh, I don't know if he's ever going to see this, but Scott's been kind of, well, unfortunately, he was the black sheep of the family because he didn't go on a mission. He was going to, and then he couldn't go at the last minute. Yeah, he didn't, well, he just he said wanted. he didn't want to go, and so, uh, so, and now, of course, now we've kind of more come around to his way of thinking, although, he, so, but he's attended church with us, and we're grateful for him. He's a good kid, and he's honest and fair, and, and you can, when if he says something, you can trust it. So we're uh, we're confident in him. So yeah. I have a question for Carl. Yeah. Um, yeah. So can you talk about how you mentioned you had a born experience in the temple when you were praying to Heavenly Father, and you got this thought, right? Can you talk uh -huh. about how that was different than perhaps your emotions or feelings, like as you said earlier? about Mormonism and how that was true? Well, it really wasn't a feeling. It was um, it was just a hard, solid knowledge. You know, and that's the one thing I've learned. I mean, in Mormonism, everything is all warm fuzzies. You know, and this was, this was just cold, hard truth. I knew there was really no feeling that came with it. The, 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 you know, the spirit or whoever it was bore witness to my soul, not my heart, but to my mind, 
And I just knew immediately that this was correct, what had been told to me. But there was no, no uh, feelings. The only emotion was I was giddy. <laughs> I mean, and you're supposed to be really quiet in the temple, and I had a hard time not just sitting there chuckling. <laughs> it was really wonderful. So there's no loud laughter. laughter. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> the truth set you free then. So. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. You bet. So how did you come across Sean's show? Did somebody... Just channel, channel surfing. I, <laughs> if there's a commercial to be had, I haven't seen it in a while. <laughs> And he was on 20, so, and actually the BYU channel used to be on, at least on Comcast, was 21. So I would usually heading over, heading over through the BYU and, and ESPN up, up in the 30s or something. And so I just flipped through it and caught this funny looking guy with the <laughs> horns behind him and all that stuff. And that was back at the time that he was interviewing a fellow from Illinois, John mm -hmm. O'Fallon or something. And... And here was a high priest who admitted that he wouldn't let his wife listen to Sean. And I'm sitting here thinking, you know what? I'm not letting my wife listen to this either. So I have something in common with him. We were both high priests. And he had a very strong testimony of the church. Obviously, I don't know where he's at now. But uh, I hope he hears this someday and we can talk. But um, So, yeah, that's how I... But the one thing, surfing. the one thing that really got Earl about Sean when he started listening to him was, it was don't don't trust me, yeah. you know trust God, mm -hmm. trust the Bible, and that really impressed Earl a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I thought that was a fair approach. I mean, and then the same with the chalkboard panel thing. I thought you know, it's fair. It's mm -hmm. you know you can study your study it. And, any other questions? How did you come across Grant Palmer's book? Probably from Sean. He's mentioned it a few times. He mentions utlm.org and as a resource, and that's been really helpful. And oh, as I got wonderful. as have I got through the thing, what's that? Have you have you met Sandra? Have you been down this? Actually, place? interviewing Sandra right <laughs> as we speak, almost uh, in process. Yeah, I interviewed her for an hour and a half last Tuesday, and we're interviewing her this Tuesday. It won't, your shows? Uh -huh. it won't air until into May or June. But, but it will be an extended show. Interview. Cause there's a lot about Sandra Tanner we just don't, or haven't, most of us don't know or haven't met. So she's uh, done a great work and kind of a pioneer, obviously. So. Yeah. Are you going to interview Carla's sister? Yes, and, Ca and Carla. Wants. I need to get yeah. Carla Now, on. I, I was supposed <laughs> yeah. to do it in October and I got bumped. For somebody else. You're a filler? I she's, would, yeah. She's a last minute filler or something. Uh, I don't yeah, I do want to do, get Carla's sister on. Now. Yeah, she's, she will be great. She's wonderful. And yeah, any of you that are former Latter day Saints, if you're interested in sharing your story, it's very easy format and uh, comfortable, and just it's just your story. So, yeah. do, you, do you get any feedback from the effectiveness of your show? Well, I don't know that I've gotten everything back, but we've had several people write and uh, and say that, that they've been influenced by someone's story, mm -hmm. which is because every story is different and some relate differently to different people, and we've had several right. that have... But you don't ask for emails, you don't ask for checks, I have you don't ask for oh, no. any of that stuff, so you don't have a, a way of communicating back. No, and we don't, and we're not on a, we don't do a call-in part either, so we don't get an immediate yeah. feedback, so. He gets lots of emails. I got a question. Yeah. So, while you were, Mara, you talking about all the ministries you ran in the LDS church, and like being a bishop, I know that, that people, younger members of the church probably come to you and maybe show that they have questions. Has anyone ever come to you and said they question the LDS Church, and they're thinking about leaving or anything while you were a bishop? Surprisingly, or? no. Really? I never had to deal with apostasy. Now, I, we had some sins, people that committed, you know, either some kind of a sin, or I had, we had one witchcraft kind of a thing that came up, which didn't relate at all to me, so I didn't 
absorb any of that. Oh, who was that? He was a very good bishop. <laughs> he kept a very good confidence. But um, never any, never any one that came to me with the changes in the Book of Mormon or the polygamy problems or masonry or. But see, the internet was, wasn't doing then what it is now. Yeah, that was a few years ago. I feel like over the last few years, or many years ago, that the internet was a really good source for Satan, but it's turned around too mm -hmm. and is an awesome source mm -hmm. for, for, truth. For, for truth and, yeah. and for that God. To, to, to yeah. learn what's really it's wonderful. out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you guys ever have any Christians witness to you or anybody challenge you in your faith while you were on your mission? Or I mean, I guess you guys were both born and raised in Utah, so, yeah. but... No, I, I didn't. I didn't... I never had to deal with any... Isn't that strange? I mean, no one ever challenged me or told me to read the Bible or... I mean, I argued or defended the church on my mission, of course, to some people, but it was... Our, our missions are so uh, laid out, I'm not sure quite how they are now, but the format and the structure is so so simple, well, it's simplistic, but it's uh, so formatted for you, you don't really do much thinking about it, you just have to memorize it. And if it's outside of that, you really don't spend much time with it. So, no, I never did. And I think that's really changed over the years because we've talked to a few people that were baptized and, or, you know, had the missionary discussions and then were baptized into the church without knowing all of these details and finally left the church because they find out. yeah find out the truth i think the retention in the church isn't what it used to be because so. people are people are able to look on the internet and stuff yeah. those are great questions you guys yeah. <laughs> what is your observation as as a layperson uh, regarding the statistic that utah has the highest usage of antidepressants in the country by double is some reports that I've read. Your own personal observations, I know on a, at, a, as a lay, at a lay level, what, do you think that the LDS Church puts a lot of pressure on people that keeps them so busy to trying to be perfect or try to measure up that it leads to a certain type of depression? Well, you know, without the statistic of the drugs, and I I mean, living in the culture, yes, you, you do feel a sense of, of pressure mm -hmm. to, to be perfect and to put on a good front all times. And this is what I was saying about never admitting we're a sinner. I mean, you just never hear you anyone hear stand up and say, um, I'm, in, I'm a sinner in need of a savior kind of thing. Save you just don't hear like that. Yeah. What's happening? Saved a wretch like me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the grace. amazing grace that's never, that concept is not in the Mormon church because you're doing your own works. And so, unless I had a statistic to back me up, I would say, well, yeah, there's a lot of pressure in the church, but I don't know if it's any more than other people. And yet, and yet, yeah. there, we are striving all the time. And so, it doesn't surprise me at all that we have this high, high use of. Stuff. But they don't advertise it. No one would want you to know if they were on an antidepressant or on a sleeping pill or, you know, no, I'm patty perfect or whatever, and you just put on that facade. Juicing your worthiness. What's that? Juicing your worthiness. Juicing. Yeah, yeah. But you yeah. put it on out there, not inside your home. Oh, right? no, not at home. And that's why, I think that's why there's a problem. Yeah, probably. Because it's on the outside of the world, you're perfect, but then in the home, you're just like well, the rest of us. And it, yeah. is, it is a hypocritical kind of a thing. It I mean, is. It's hard to live that way because you know how you are inside. And I think children see parents live those double lives. Mm -hmm. yeah. They That's know that, that, you know, we used to laugh at home with my mom before before she went. Uh, we, we would we'd be fighting and arguing and then we'd mock each other because we all did it but you'd answer the phone after you're fighting and screaming and hello <laughs> you know, we used to laugh about that so much because there you're contending and then hello just so you know so people doesn't don't know that there's stuff going on in the house yeah. but there is a lot of pressure i think well for, you for compare yourself be, i'm sorry to interrupt no that's right you're you comparing know. You're comparing yourself to the other women in the ward. Oh, look, she does this, she does that, I don't do that. And a big thing in the LDS church is the women hate Mother's Day. They hate to go to church on Mother's Day. They feel so guilty. 
because the talks are all about yeah how wonderful mm -hmm. mothers are and they realize you know they're not that wonderful mm -hmm. so a lot of women won't go on Mother's Day mm -hmm. on that same line can you just talk about like the freedom that you felt when you came out of Mormonism and didn't have to put on all that facade and the, I, I dealt a lot without the masks of Mormonism mm -hmm. letting that go and not you know being real so talk a little bit about that if you can. Oh boy, that has been wonderful, but I need to let you know my true confession. I'm still pulling off layers. Layers. <laughs> the layers, yes, like an onion. Um, you know, sometimes I'll be sitting and I'll feel that I'm, you know, all tensed up and I think, oh, you know, why am I feeling that way? And sometimes, um, oh, Maybe even every day I'll think I need to be doing something. There's something I need to be doing. You know, I haven't done this today, or I haven't been out in public glorifying God today, or I mean, it takes a long time, you know, to peel that Mormonism off. So we've been married now almost, what, 44 years? Yeah. So, I mean, at least 44 years as a married person, temple worthy, it's, it's hard. Do you feel, in just knowing, knowing that you're forgiven of your sins? Yeah. Oh, man. Do you feel a great, really have freedom? And well, oh, that's, yeah. that was another common it's thing that a lot of people have shared on the X-Files, is this freedom and the burden lifted off their shoulders. Mm -hmm. Being able to go to church a little more relaxed, but having a personal relationship with Christ, uh, looking to Him as, as God, as an awesome God, and not having... I mean, before we, he was our elder brother, Jesus was our elder brother, and... An afterthought. Yeah, in a way, just kind of an afterthought. So we've appreciated that freedom, and, and when we give, we give because we want to. It's not because we're expected to have some 10% mm -hmm. level there, and, mm -hmm. and we give because we are grateful. So Where do you go to church? Well, we do visit other churches around because of the X-Files. We try to invite people to share their stories. Last week we were up at Idaho Falls, Calvary Chapel. Again, we've been there twice. And, but normally we go to Sean McCraney's oh, yeah. uh, up at the camp, university. campus up there. Yeah, because he, I mean, he just teaches he's kind verse of by verse, verse, you know, from the Bible. And we also study with Les Feldick, if you're familiar with him at all. He's on the television every day. And he preaches verse by verse out of the Bible. So we also, you know, do that study too. But the, again, we kind of spoiled with Sean in the sense that it's never a topic. It's always, we, we bo actually go to both the morning and the afternoon because we just, he's in Matthew and Romans and just goes through verse by verse. And we're, we're so new, I've read the Bible, as I said many times, but I've never understood the Bible, never really read it. So we're learning so much from, from these I mean, I never lessons. read the Bible. I mean, you know, I'd read Luke at, the, at Christmas time, or if I had to prepare a lesson or something for a class I was teaching, it would sometimes give me not just Book of Mormon, but, you know, Bible references, but it would just be a verse here or there. I mean, I... You know, I know about Jonah and the whale, but I didn't know the story or the circumstances. I mean, that's embarrassing. You know, and Paul, do you know who Paul was to me? He was the guy named Saul, and he was converted to the Lord on the road to Damascus and changed his name to Paul. That is all I knew about Paul. <laughs> yeah, he's, I mean... We're grateful for David, and we're grateful for Paul. <laughs> yeah. Looks like we're... You're cutting off. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's okay. But, you know, in, 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 in Mormonism, I mean, David's not going to heaven. I always felt so sorry for David. Because, <laughs> no, he's going to heaven. I don't know why that was something that always stuck in my mind, even as a child, that he wasn't going to heaven. That's what I thought was interesting is that... Growing up, you always think, you know, Abraham's this righteous man, David's this righteous person, Moses is right. Then you, and as you really read the scriptures, you see they're all sinners. Sure. <laughs> they all disobeyed God. They all, I mean, they murdered, they lied, they did it all. But they repented. But, they, you know, yeah. but God was still forgave yeah. them and used them for his purpose. Yeah. I mean, when you see that, it's cool. 
Well, yeah. why didn't you think he was going to heaven? Was it because of the adultery or uh, the murder? The or, murder. Or the fact he wasn't married in the temple? Murder. <laughs> the polygamy. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> if he hadn't committed murder uh, indirectly, you know, he sent him out to the front lines or whatever to be killed, but um, you cannot be forgiven of murder in the LDS church. I mean, if he hadn't committed murder, mm -hmm. we would have converted him in the millennium. That's when we're going to do the, all that extra missionary work. But there was no way because of the murder. Correct. Yes. Well, Paul was a murderer too, though. Right. He, he wouldn't have. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so, DNC forty two eighteen says explicitly that the, he who kills there's no forgiveness in this life nor in the life to come. Yeah. yeah, they were they were subject to the telestial kingdom. Of yeah. Anyone. Where does it say that? In DNC 4218. He read Hebrews, yeah. He said he read the whole yeah, Bible. Yeah. Now you said, though, of course you didn't understand it as while you were a Mormon, because when you, when you read it, you see that you don't need the Aaronic priesthood, you don't need the temple. Now I see that's all been fulfilled in Christ. I just wonder, have you got to that point reading it, and what did you think? Well, not only that, but I've gone through now again back to my old analytical stuff but i uh, actually have made a long list of scriptures that we use in the lds church or that the lds use and how they're actually interpreted there's a one in john 15 16 i used on my mission many times it says that you have not chosen me but i have chosen you and ordained you well that was the melchizedek priesthood but now that i read it it doesn't say anything about Melchizedek priesthood, and I would have sworn it did, you know. Then the two sticks of Judah and Joseph coming together is, has nothing to do with a Book of Mormon. It has to do with government kind of stuff, and they're just so I've I've got along with baptism for the dead. Paul never taught baptism for the dead. He made this rhetorical question: so the well, Why are you doing this if you don't believe in resurrection? And it wasn't a teaching. And then now, of course, we found out that a lot of this stuff isn't in the Book of Mormon either. Right. There's no temple rituals in no. the Book of Mormon, or Paul never talked about it. So, anyway, we've enjoyed that part of it, being able to kind of challenge our faith. And that's one of the freedoms I was thinking about when you mentioned that, because I can, I can study anything now. It doesn't really matter what it is, because I have the Bible, the Word of God, to ma match it up against. Whereas in Mormonism, I guess there was a fear of studying because beyond we allowed. beyond the you know. normal mm -hmm. gospel stuff, we did have a fellow that that um, said don't study. Well, yeah, we've had too that much, too, but, but he just picked up his <laughs> quad or his four oh. standard works, and he says, "This is all I read. This is all that's These necessary." These are the only books, or the authorized books. You know, not, the not that he shouldn't read those, but uh, you know, and that's what we do with the Word of God, the Bible, of course. But, but just just a total freedom to be willing to look at anything and match it up against the Bible. What did Paul and Jesus talk about? Mm -hmm. but the Bible is in that quad. It is. It is. <laughs> but, so, so, but, not so much. but as far as it's translated <laughs> correctly. No. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, the Book of Mormon's a pretty Christian book. It is. It really is Christian. So where did they also, come from? <laughs> huh? The Book of Mormon? From the Bible. <laughs> Just and plagiarized. Some other yeah. book, yeah, plagiarized. A lot of other things written. I think so. At Joseph Smith's time. I don't believe it came from gold plate. It's translated. Mm -hmm. And then even even that kind of fell apart on me because then I started finding out that Joseph Smith didn't sit there with his finger and yeah. translate. That, that he <laughs> yeah, had his head in a hat and a seer stone. I didn't know that until a year or so ago. And so and you were like, what? <laughs> I said, oh, so, I never knew that. So that, you know, those things, and then I find out that the the witnesses, that was another thing that really oh, held me funny. strong, was Not the witnesses. Me too. And then come to find out that they use what they call second vision, second sight, spiritual eyes. Well, I don't look at this pencil on your desk the way I looked at those. I see them with my spiritual eyes. Well. If you sit and just imagine, you can imagine anything. You can imagine angels and con you know, chariots and gold plates and that weren't even that don't around exist, that time. but they're in your spiritual eyes. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're led by a mesmerizer. You know, yeah, powerful. probably. A, a hypnotist. Tell you what you're supposed to be looking you. at. Yeah. 
see whatever you want to see. That's true. Anyway, so that was that was kind of revealing, and that was kind of a, a last well, bastion of the church that kind of fell there. Yeah, the witnesses were always big to me, but now we've come to find out basically they were all relatives. Why didn't you use some political person or somebody to, relatives you know, to business. witness? Yeah, use the mayor. Use the mayor and a few attorneys yeah. and a couple of professional sheriff or somebody to witness these gold plates instead of the Whitmer family and the Smith family. You know, it's kind of convenient. Well, the thing, uh, this was before my born again experience, listening to the radio that night. But uh, Joseph Smith, I, have you all heard of the Boston statement? Mm -hmm. I'd never heard that. I guess I'd heard it. I mean, it sounded familiar, but I actually read it, and I thought. This man is putting him above our Savior Jesus Christ. I thought there's no way that he could be a prophet. That is what really tipped me over before I had these other experiences. And I brought I brought that up to a friend of mine who's a Mormon, and his uh -huh. justification was that Paul did the same thing. Not really, but when Paul was talking about how much he'd suffered, mm -hmm. yeah, the part about that, it, 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 it's not to the extent that Joseph Smith. Like, no, no, so that, he didn't put himself his... above Jesus. No, I mean Paul always testified of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And I just was like, okay. Yeah, <laughs> that was it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for your attention yeah, this tonight. This has just been so delightful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Thank you so much. Would Praise you, God. Earl, would you pray and close us? Yeah. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we're so grateful for all you've done for us, and we love you. We're, we appreciate the freedom and joy we feel trusting in you and as an almighty God who has done a great work and continues to do a great work in our lives, and we pray in the lives of others. We know and understand the bondage of Mormonism and the, and the deception the Bible talks about so much, false prophets, false Christ, other gospels that will come, especially in these latter days, to deceive men. And we know that in our personal lives that many of us have been deceived before. And we appreciate the freedom you've given us and coming to have our eyes see. And we pray for our families and those that are struggling or that don't know that they aren't seeing that you'll touch their hearts in some way. We appreciate the Savokas and their uh, opening their home to all of us and for all we enjoy at your hand and we appreciate you and love you. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.